Let us pray together. Lord God, from ancient words of prophecy, speak to us a new call today and show us how to prepare the way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read our scripture lesson for this morning from Isaiah 40 in just a minute. It's one of the passages that inspired our Advent theme this year, a voice crying in the wilderness. And today that voice calls us to prepare the way of the Lord. But before I read it, I want to set it up a bit for the listening. Last week, I hope you were with us or heard, we began our Advent journey with a moment of honesty. This time of year, we are swimming in preparation We're preparing our homes and get-togethers and cards and gifts. But when we talk about Advent as a season of preparation, we're not preparing for a holiday. We're preparing for a Lord who's coming to change the world and us. So in this season, we can set aside our expectations of picture-perfect holidays to acknowledge where we are as we start the journey to Bethlehem, and we are in a world of wilderness. That sounds dire, I know. But friends, wilderness isn't new. There are wilderness stories all over our scriptures, all the way back to Genesis, seasons of wandering and fear, God's people purposeless and adrift, There are stories about communities broken apart, violence, oppression, and disconnection from God. We know these same kinds of wilderness. We look around, and there they are still. War, violence, fear, anxiety, pain, and isolation. And we, even sitting here this morning, looking good, and y'all are looking really good, We are each walking some path, maybe a hidden one, that makes us feel isolated or afraid, even if you can't see it in our lovely Christmas card pictures. Last week, we let ourselves name that wilderness so that our Advent journey might be honest and transformative, and we heard good news. While God has not promised that we will avoid wilderness in life, God has promised to be with us in it. Through all those Bible stories of being lost and alone, of broken communities and people wandering in the dark, God remains. The book of Isaiah is one of those stories. It's 66 chapters of prophecy, actually spoken by more than one person over a generations-long season of wilderness Here's the context. In the sixth century before Christ's birth, Babylon invaded Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, sent leaders from Jerusalem to live in Babylon as exiles, and then stayed as an occupying force. The same pattern is playing out on the world stage even now. A cycle of violence and occupation and intentional breaking down of community. The technology and weapons have changed, but humans have used the same playbook to take and hold power for thousands of years. For the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, before we get to our scripture today, and in several other books of prophecy like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, God's people have been told that they are responsible for their exile. They got themselves into their fix with their sin. And the prophets speak accusation and blame into their wilderness. But chapter 40, where we are this morning, turns from blaming to a word of comfort to God's people. And I'm so glad for a word of comfort. When I'm in wilderness and I can't see my own way out, I need a powerful word of comfort to help me start walking again. As I read Isaiah 40, I invite you to listen for the different voices that will cry out in these verses. We hear God's voice and the prophet speaking God's word, and we hear voices of the community. 
There are voices crying out to us in wilderness, bringing good news. And there are also voices that sound like us in the wilderness, hearing this call to prepare the way and trying to know what that means. We hear the promise that God will make a way, and we also hear that we are supposed to join in the work of sharing good news. We will even become voices in the wilderness of the world. Paul Hansen describes it this way. Isaiah presents the divine purpose not as an avenue of escape from the nitty-gritty of the world, but as an invitation to join in the restoration of the world to justice and peace. Friends, hear now God's word from Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term. Her penalty is paid. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That first beautiful line, comfort, oh, comfort my people, is a word we need. In Advent, we sing it, we pray it, we long for it. Comfort that could stop the spinning of our worried minds. Comfort that could shore us up for the hard things we still have to do. If wilderness is our shared experience, comfort is the word that comes to us in that wilderness and it gives us hope for something different. As I said, when this scripture came to them, God's people had been in exile for some 50 years, and God saw their pain and came to them in comfort. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her, says God. God is intimately present there in the wilderness, speaking not accusation, but care even crying as we cry. To be comforted is to have God sit with us in pain, cry with us in grief, find us when we're in the woods without a map or a path. But the Hebrew word translated here as comfort means something else too. It means to reverse one's mind or state of feeling. So God's comfort doesn't just meet us where we are, it changes us where we are. To be comforted by God is also to have our pain replaced with well-being, our sorrow transformed into rejoicing, fear made into hope, and lostness into clarity. For God's people who had been in exile for so long, who'd seen their community broken apart, who wondered whether home would ever feel like home again, comfort is not sentimental. Comfort 
is powerful. It means that God wants to take them out of the wilderness and lead them home. I think this moment of comfort is pivotal, not just for the journey of Advent, but for life, our life of faith. Because without God coming to us and then intervening to change us, we would stay in the wilderness. God's comfort is what sets us on a different path and reverses even us. Reversal is God's way, after all. The whole story of Advent reverses every expectation. God comes into darkness as light. God enters a world ruled by tyrants as a little baby. God disrupts social systems as the child of an unwed teenager. God defies power structures that are propped up by violence, coming as the prince of peace. God's comfort resets us so that we can participate in that story of reversal. After God has spoken comfort, then we hear a voice crying out, saying, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. But there's a problem. God's people can't. They can't make their own way out of the wilderness, so God will have to make a path for them and for us. The images here are of a long trek with threatening terrain. There's a desert to be survived. There are mountains to climb and valleys to cross. But the God of reversal will make those threatening places safe. Every valley will be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low, The rocky path will be level and the rough places walkable. And then walking God's highway out of the desert, says the prophet, God's people will see together the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. If the prophecy ended there, it would be beautiful and poetic and stirring. But let's be honest, not that tangible for us. But then... Another voice comes into the dialogue, a voice that says, cry out, an imperative, an instruction for the community to participate in preparing the way, cry out. And the bravest person in the room says, what shall I cry? I'm grateful for that voice. It's a small voice in my mind who says what the community has to be thinking, Comfort, change, preparing, that's great. But when it turns from God's work to ours, what shall we cry? Another voice responds, presumably that of the prophet, rerouting God's wandering people on firm ground. The prophet reminds them that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. In other words, human tyrants will fall. Man-made structures will not last. The violence of people will not be the end of the story because the only thing that is eternal is God. The path that leads out of wilderness is not human-made. It is the eternal order God is bringing where the arms of the world are replaced with love and all who hurt are gathered in like lambs by a shepherd. Cry that, says the prophet. Cry that to a world that needs to hear it. Get yourself high on a mountain. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, don't be afraid, and tell the world about your God. Your God who comforts, your God who loves, your God who reverses the expectations of the world. The prophet tells us to become the voice speaking into the wilderness, comforting another, sharing good news with the hurting world. This comfort might be simple. It might be sitting with another in pain. That's comfort. Acknowledging how far we are from the perfect pictures of the season, that's comfort. Listening without judgment, crying together. It might be opening ourselves to someone else's comfort and having our hearts changed. Or it might be shouting from the mountain. 
preparing the world for reversal, that's comfort too. It might be breaking down structures that keep the rich rich and the poor poor, shutting down the narrative that the response to violence is more violence, refusing to cede authority to tyrants anytime they try to take power. This too is God's word of comfort. That voice cries to us, prepare the way, be changed, and join God in this world reversing work. I said that I'm grateful for that small voice in the middle of this passage that says, what shall I cry? Because I think this call to prepare the way is hard, especially for people like us who want so badly to get everything right. I think it's particularly hard for adults and maybe especially high-achieving, well-educated, successful folks. None, nobody like that in this room. People who, if we're going to prepare the way of the Lord, we want to prepare it the best way, the first time, for the best Lord. If we're going to cry out, we're going to do all our research and maybe get a consultant to help us craft just the right message that needs to be cried out the right way. But friends, God is not calling us to picture perfect preparation. God is bringing us down into the nitty gritty where God is, and there's plenty to prepare there. There's comfort to give, comfort to receive, change to make. One person, one narrative, one story sharing, one vote at a time. One city, county, state, and nation at a time until we have prepared the world for God's justice and peace. When I get overwhelmed by that call to prepare the way, and I do, I take a lesson from kids. They're not as hesitant or stuck in the wilderness of their own journeys as adults can be. I think of every Christmas pageant I have ever seen, and that's a lot, and we'll have one again at five o'clock today. Y'all know kids sing us to Bethlehem in Christmas pageants, and the loudest and most unabashed song of all is always, go tell it on the mountain. I think it's because there are motions, and kids love motions. Y'all know this one, go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere. everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ is coming into our wilderness to comfort and change and save. Kids cry it out, not with fear that they'll misstep in their preparations, not with any expectation of something being right. They sing it with hope and joy and volume. They delight in having preparations to make and having a part in this inbreaking of a loving God. There's a video circulating on social media right now of a little boy in England named Milo. Has anyone seen it? I'll send it to you later. In this video, Milo's mom picks him up from school, and as he gets in the car, still in his school uniform, little Milo is bubbling over with excitement. He tells his mom that he's been assigned his part in the nativity play, and he can't wait for her to guess it because it's a classic part. Classic. She starts to guess, are you Joseph? No, he says, but it is a classic role. Are you a wise man? No. An innkeeper? No. The mom's getting worried. She can't think of any more classic parts. So she says, tell me. And he says, with total unabashed delight, I'm door holder number three. <laughs> I'll be holding doors. The mom doesn't miss a beat. She says, that's amazing. Who will you be holding doors for? Probably Mary and Joseph. He says proudly. Were you pleased when they gave you the part? Asks his mom, and this kid replies, I said, I'm a door holder. Get in there. Let's go. What 
joy at being part of the story of Advent. What a delight it is to go and cry out, to tell it on the mountain, to join in God's work of preparing the way. Take comfort, people of God. There are still voices calling to us, even in wilderness. They don't cry out to accuse or shame. They don't tell us to be perfect. They call us to be willing. And so we pray. Holy coming one, help us to prepare the way for your changed world. Open our hearts and turn them and give us the courage and joy to cry out to others with your compassion and love. Amen.